Did it beep? Okay, excellent. I will begin. Dear Father, we uh, thank you for this day and uh, for all the CFAs attending this class. And we just pray that you be glorified in what we do this day, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Let's see here. What? No? I did not. I didn't say that I wasn't grateful for CFAs. That's not, not what I said. You're reading, reading too much into it. All right, so I have um, just uh, scanned or printed, whatever you want to say, a uh, number of sections in um, Snaf Saf and Snyder's complex book, which is my runner-up for this course. Like, the reason I didn't use it for your textbook is pretty simple. It's like $170. And... Um, as all the textbooks, I love it in certain parts and don't care for it in others. But one of the strengths of Sapp and Snyder's book is it really does have a really, really good treatment of conformal mapping. And so I'm stealing heavily from that textbook today. And so let's just draw some pictures here. Um, if we have a domain D and we have a domain D prime, right? We can think about the point Z naught mapping over here to the point W naught equal to say F of Z naught. We have in mind some kind of complex differentiable function F. All right. And um, so then the idea is a little bit sneaky here, but um, if we have a um, solution to, let's say, Laplace's equation. Suppose we have harmonic function uh, phi here. So in other words, phi would be a function, uh, you know, this would solve what? It solves phi xx plus phi yy equals to what? Equals to zero, right? Um, well, we, we could also con consider, um, and suppose we're considering a function, a complex differentiable function f, which is also invertible. All right, it's also invertible at this point, w naught. So we, we also have, you know, the inverse mapping to play with. All right, f inverse, right? So, if I want to construct a function over on d prime, which is somehow related to the function phi on d, how could I do it? Like, let's say I wanted to find psi of w. I want psi of w to be somehow related, somehow related to the, the given harmonic function phi, right? And so here's, here's the way you do it. You could say, oh, well, I, I'm going to let psi of w be equal to, see, because um, if we've got w close to w naught, like here, then that tracks back under the inverse map to some z, which is equal to f inverse of w, right? So, you know, I, I can change that w, um, Let's see how to say this. Lost, lost track. So I could say that that's equal to, perhaps this would work, phi of what? F inverse of W. So f inverse of w would be like an input in the z, the z domain, right? So this, w this formula would make sense. That's a, a reasonable input for the phi function, right? And uh, I mean, I'm, I'm proposing. Here's a proposal. So we're given, again, given the phi, we're given this function f that's invertible. 
at the pointing consideration. And so we can construct this new function, psi, like so. All right? And just to keep things simple, let's, let's even assume that this harmonic function is actually, you know, um, I, I guess we could assume it's the real part of a complex differentiable function, but I'd honestly rather just think that, that the, the phi is in fact a complex differentiable function, because we know that if we have a complex differentiable function, in other words, a holomorphic function, then it will satisfy Laplace's equation, right? So if, if phi is a holomorphic function and f is a holomorphic function, what do you get to say about psi? It's the composite of complex differentiable functions, which is again, complex differentiable, right? So this is a way of automatically constructing a psi over here, psi lives over here, is harmonic. Now, you, you could go through the same argument assuming that phi is real valued. Um, so here would be the argument. If we think of phi being real, real valued, we take phi, we find its harmonic conjugate. That allows us to construct a complex valued function. Let's, let's say, um, well, we, 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 yeah, I'm not sure I want to get into all that. All right, you know what? Let me go through it. It's, it's probably wise for us to do it. So suppose that this is real valued. Real valued, all right. Then what can we do? We can construct, um, I need yet another letter. Let's say phi um, equal to, you know, um, phi of z, well, phi plus i times and I need a, what, what, do you want to, what do you want me to call the harmonic conjugate of phi to be? Phi, phi hat. Okay, I'll allow it. Now, since the function is, um, since phi is harmonic, it follows that it has a harmonic conjugate. All right, there, there is a theorem which says that. I'm not sure I've proved that at this point, but it is something we could prove. Um, so there exists a harmonic conjugate, so that means that we can construct big phi, which is complex differentiable, right? Well, let's get to the point, holomorphic at z naught. Then, <clears throat> if we construct, um, you know, let's say psi, uh, capital psi, like see, I'll put some like that. Uh, and I'll, ca I'll construct that by capital phi of f inverse of w. Then capital psi is a holomorphic function because it's the composite of the holomorphic function capital phi and the given inverse to f, which is also assumed to be complex differentiable. So capital Psi is holomorphic, which means what? Where is it holomorphic? At W naught. Because by construction, F inverse maps to, um, oh, shnikes, let's see here. All right, well, let me, let me not write that. Actually, I'm not certain of that. In any event, this is holomorphic, which means then I can take the real part of that. The real part of this, and I can call it just without the hat, I mean, without the you know, lowercase psi, if you will, and that will be harmonic. So this is basically the game. If we have a real valued harmonic function, we take it, we find its conjugate, that gives us a holomorphic function. We use composition with the inverse to move it to the other side. And then we go, oh, wait a minute. Well, 
composites of holomorphic functions are holomorphic, so then that is a holomorphic function over there. So if we take the real component of that, that's a harmonic function in the sense that it solves Laplace's equation. Which Laplace's equation does psi solve, though? It doesn't solve psi xx plus psi yy equal to zero. Psi solves the harmonic equation. This one is harmonic in the sense that psi uu plus psi vv equals to zero. That's Laplace's equation in the w plane. See, that's the difference. In the z plane, we have xy coordinates. In the w plane, on the right hand side, we have uv coordinates, right? Because your typical point over here is Oh, come on. Whew. Man, I think it's really on there. z equals to x plus iy, right? Over here, we have w is equal to u plus iv. That's our traditional notation for the w plane versus the z plane. And we like to look at functions that go from z to w and study the mapping transformations as they go back and forth and so forth. So this is essentially the idea of conformal mapping that we can take a solution to Laplace's equation in the z and transport it over to a solution to Laplace's equation in the w. Or you could go vice versa. You could take something over here and map it over there if you think about these ideas more. But I'm going to stick with just um, building at the moment we've built an equation over in w using the, F, the, the inverse map to f. Um, the other interesting thing, of course, is the way that we solve um, boundary value problems. So Laplace's equations, uh, Laplace equations, interesting enough, but we can solve Laplace's equation subject to boundary, boundary values. Let me show you an example of that. Um, let's see here. Oh. Actually, just, we should just pause here for a second. Thought experiment. You guys tell me. Let's turn the tables. Turn the tables for a second. Suppose that you were given psi. Let's, let's, let's engage in a thought experiment. All right. Instead, imagine... You're given, you know, psi, a um, harmonic function uh, near w naught. All right, and we'll just we'll make it complex valued just to keep it simple enough, so we don't have to go through this real, 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 blah, 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 blah. So suppose you have a complex valued function near w naught, all right? Well, then that means it's harmonic. How would you take a psi which is given and construct phi over here? How would you construct phi near z naught, which by the way is equal to f inverse of w naught? So I need the formula. You tell me, guys, what phi of z should be equal to. And I guess I should say capital phi, given my current blathering.
What is it? Yeah? Is it the... Uh, well, we, we have, remember, we have, we, have, we, have, we have this to work with, right? Yeah. So, so psi of what? Psi of f of z, we have a winner, yes. Yep. So this would be a useful thought process if we had a given solution to Laplace's equation over here that we like for some reason, and we want to transport it back to the z domain. We can do that by just composition, with, with basically use f to move z over to there, then the psi solves Laplace's equation in the way we like in the w plane, and that gives us a way of going the other way. Very good, that's it. All right. Um, <clears throat> let me show you an example of this. All right, so let, let me just show you a quick example of something like this. Um, solve, find solution to um, uxx, well, I guess I'm using phi, phi xx plus phi yy equal to zero, um, such that, uh, let's see here. We have phi equals to 20 for the uh, modulus of z equals to 1. And we have phi equals to 30 for modulus of z equal to 2. So let me draw a picture to say what we're trying to do. We're trying to solve Laplace's equation on a, well, a donut, I suppose. So here's, this is radius 1, this is radius 2, right? And we want to solve Laplace's equation such that we've got value 20 in here, and we've got value 30 out here. All right. So my claim is that we can Everyone heard it, so it's okay. If it was just me, I would worry. All right, so um, good. Let's see here. So I think my proposal, and this is just a madcap proposal, is that we can use phi of z is a natural log of the modulus of z plus b for just appropriate choices of a and b. Now, you might wonder where on earth that's coming from. The reason this is a reasonable proposal, how do I know that that's a harmonic function? Here's my, you know, man behind the curtain. Remember that um, if we have capital phi of z, it's something like a constant times the logarithm of z plus, you know, b, where b is a real constant. Is that, is that a complex differentiable function? Yes, it is. We've proved that the log, the principal logarithm is complex differentiable, right? And so, in fact, we know that that is what? Like a natural log, the modulus of z, plus i a arg, arg of z plus b actually, right? And so if I just look at the, if I just look at the real, com if supposing here that a and b are real constants for the moment, okay? You could let them be complex, we'd still get a complex differentiable function, but I'm, I'm thinking of a and b as being real, all right? So if a and b are real, certainly capital phi so constructed is complex differentiable, hence has component functions which are solution, solutions to Laplace's equation, right? Furthermore, the real part is essentially just a natural log plus b, right? And my point is that that's pretty nice to work with on, on annular regions. If you want to have a constant value around a circle, that's, you know, that's your man right there. I mean, that's the one you want because, you know, we, we, can, we can try it out. Like, you know, inner circle, phi of, um, phi of z would be a natural log the mod absolute value of 1 um, plus b, but log of 1 is 0, so what's b equal to? We find b is 20. Right? 
And um, what else here? How about phi of, so this is for the modulus of z equal to 1. For modulus of z equals to 2, or absolute value equal to 2, we've got a natural log of 2 plus 20, because we just learned b was 20, equals to 30. So what's that tell me about a? Work it out. A is equal to, looks like 10 over natural log of 2. Am I right? 20, 30 minus 20 is 10. 10 over log 2 is a. Put it all together. There you go. We have phi of z equals to, what did I just say? 10 over the natural log of 2. Natural log of the modulus of z plus 20. There you go. That is a solution to Laplace's equation on that annulus. Now I showed you for inner radius 1 and outer radius 2, but I think you can see you could do this for any choice of radii, right? So now you can solve Laplace's equation on donuts in the plane if you like, yeah? Pretty cool. Um, now, <laughs> to, be, to be fussy, you know, is the uh, principal logarithm complex differentiable on the whole, uh, whole annulus? It is not. But does that matter? That's the funny thing here, right? The place where it fails, right, is in the imaginary part. The imaginary part is the part that's got the discontinuity. In fact, the real part is harmonic on the whole annulus as it happens. This is a quirk, but you know, hey, it worked, it works. You know, um, this is not a derivation, this is a uh, educated guessing kind of thing we're doing. Um, so it doesn't really matter how you found the guess, the fact that the guess works is enough, yeah. Now the other thing you could do with this kind of solution would be what if you wanted to solve Laplace's equation on like a sector, right? What if you wanted to solve something like, you know, maybe you want phi equals to zero here and you want phi equals to 10 over, over here, yeah? And you want to solve up in here. In other words, you, you know, for theta equals to pi over 2, you want 10. For theta equals to zero, you want zero, just for the sake of discussion. What would, you, what would you suggest we use there? I, I would suggest we, we try out phi, and maybe instead, this 10 is too easy almost, right? I mean, zero is almost too easy to put there, but I, I put it there already, so we'll, we'll deal with it. But I think generically speaking, you would want to use something like phi of z is equal to a, um, you know, ar, um, well, arg. Maybe that's the wrong thing to write, but um, goodness, I don't know what to write there. Uh, Fine, A arg plus B. But in this particular context, I can replace that argument with actually inverse tangent of the imaginary part over the real part, right? How do I know that that's harm? Yeah. So is it always something that's A times something plus B? And you're trying to I'm, figure out what that something is? Yeah, I'm putting. I think that's a pretty good template for, we can do a lot with that. Okay. Is that all that's, all that's out there for conformal mapping? No. There is much more <laughs> that we won't cover. So, um, This is the start of a very big idea. I will show you how to get started. I'm not going to make you guys masters of conformal mapping. That's deeper. But this does a lot, right? Because with that, th with that adjustment, we can basically, this allows us to use whichever principal argument we like and then just kind of shift it by adding the, the B. Uh, um, you know, if I just used arg sub alpha and I wanted this to go from, you know, like 3 pi to 3 pi plus pi over 2, then I could make do with the appropriate choice of the argument with A equals to 1 even, you know? But if I want to... Well, you could do that, but then, you know, sine of 
si the other complex functions we've we've learned about those have different level curves like what are the level curves for the you know the logarithm the imaginary part has is level um, you know if I set the imaginary component to the principal <coughs> to the log complex logarithm equal to a constant you're looking at rays from the origin if I set the real part of the complex log logarithm equal to a constant the level curves are, are circles for other complex functions the level curves are other things those other things then um, if you want one of those other things to be your, ba your, your boundary to the Laplace equation, then you probably should be looking at that other complex function. So yeah, I mean, sine or cosh or exponential, these have different uh, level curves, and so those would correspond to different kinds of solutions. But what I'm describing right now, I call these template solutions. They're just kind of standard, yeah. All right. So what I'm trying to tell you at the moment, I'm just trying to give you a little bit more insight into the fact that we can solve Laplace's equation on some nice, simple shapes, and it's not that hard, right? Um, <clears throat> but now I want to try to talk more about this, this, this f. You know, how do we? <clears throat> So the, 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 the technique of conformal mapping has, has, has got two, two big moving pieces. The one moving piece, so to speak, is the construction of Laplace's equation with respect to some choice of, of, of boundary, right? The other piece is deciding, you know, which mapping F you want to use to take that nice boundary and perhaps map it back to something uglier. Let's see if we can think about a mapping which perhaps takes, well, let's finish this one. What was my actual formula here? This one might be actually be better for me to pick at. Phi of z is what? Phi of z, what do I got? Um, I think just 10 times 2 over pi um, argument Z will, will do nicely, right? Because you can try it out. When we, put in, we, when we put in the real axis, we get the angle zero. When we put in the imaginary axis, we get what? Pi over two, pi over two times two over pi is one, which leaves me 10. There you go. That solves Laplace's equation on the quarter plane with those boundary conditions, zero on the real axis, 10 on the imaginary, right? Now you could complain, it solves it on more than that. I wouldn't disagree, right? I mean, this actually is a solution on much more than just that, but in particular, I'm focusing on the quarter plane and I've got boundary value zero on the real axis and boundary value 10 on the imaginary axis, right? Now, let's see here. If I wanted to say, take that, what would happen can you guys, so let's see, we're thinking of that as being z. I'm, I'm trying to think of some interesting uh, uh, transformation we could do. If this is the z plane and the w, what, what, you know, what, 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 what f do we want to look at to illustrate the, the theorem here is my, is my next decision I apparently need to make. <laughs> see here, if e equals 0, if e equals 10. This is z-plane. I want to come up with some function f that does something interesting, but not too interesting to this quarter plane. Can you guys give me a, a complex differentiable function that, I don't know, let's, what would the exponential do? This is a bad idea. Um, no, let's not do the exponential. How, how, um, I don't know, what would you guys do? Uh, square, we could square it. The reciprocal function's not, that, that might be interesting actually, f of z equals to 1 over z. Wait a minute, I'm listening to Sam right now. Does that seem wise? All right, uh, but I'm, I'm going to do it. Um, oh, what does the reciprocal function do to the upper quarter plane? Just, just, just square it. 
Yes, I should just square it. Yeah, you guys are right. I'll, all right, I'll just square it. All right. I, anyway, so if I just square it, then, then this, the image becomes the what? Upper half plane, right? And zero maps to zero, and the imaginary axis ma maps to the negative real axis, right? So let's see here. If we want to construct psi over here, how do we do it? Psi of w built from this, we're supposed to do what? Phi of what is it? What's the, what's the rule? We do phi of f inverse of w. Yeah? So what's f inverse? Yeah, square root. In fact, for there, we can use the what? I, the, the principal square root, right? I believe. Isn't that the domain of the principal square root? Don't know. Uh, which square root do we need is my question, guys. Should have used the reciprocal. Jerk. It's here. <laughs> All right. Let's just, let's just talk it smack over here. Let's hear a uh, fee of, uh, how about, um, well, we need the square root of the modulus of W. Yeah? e to the i, pr appropriate argument, appropriate argument of w divided by 2, right? So my question is, what's the appropriate argument to use there? If this is going to make sense, whatever we're feeding into here should be what? This should be, if I call this theta, we should have what? We should have 0 less than theta less than pi over 2, right? Which means that we probably should be using the... Can we just use the principal argument then? Oh, we can. Okay, good. All right. Cool. So there you go. Um, that, and now what is that actually? But um, let's see here, details. What is this actually? This is phi of the square root of u squared, u squared plus v squared times, you know, e to the i. Um, I believe we can just say inverse tangent of v over u. I think in this particular context, that's okay. Am I wrong? I'm wrong. Yeah, I'm wrong. u equals zero. That's not just that. <sighs> ah. Well, I'm just going to leave it at that. I mean, that is, I'd like to give you explicit formulas for it, but I, I should, I know better, I should just go on at the moment. But there you go, that, that actually is a solution to Laplace's equation on the half plane, which puts, um, let's see here, puts the, the uh, psi of this part 0, psi of that part 10, now, the stupid thing about what I just did is we could easily solve the problem, the transform problem, as a template problem, so this is completely unnecessary. So I guess Sam is vindicated. <laughs> right? Because the smart way to solve, to find boundary value 0 here and boundary value 10 here would just be to straight away use the principal argument function on the W plane, right? I mean, I can tell you the formula should work out to psi of w is equal to um, well, stink. It's, it's something like a times arg of w plus b, where I got to choose a and b appropriately, not the same a and b, obviously, because I, 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 you know, I have argument of that's pi. I want the this is pi, so I guess the, if that's going to be pi for the, arg the w argument, then I need this to be 10 over pi arg w, and I think b is 0, yeah. 
So this is what this should work out to after you fuss with it for a while. Because the circled red equation satisfies the boundary conditions that I've stated. In other words, it's got psi equal to zero here and psi equals to 10 there. Now, if we take the reciprocal mapping <laughs> that Sam was talking about for a second, what does the reciprocal mapping do? If you want to think about it, it takes stuff inside the unit circle and it flips it outside the unit circle. Um, and it also does what? I mean, what does reciprocal mapping do? 1 over r e to the i theta is what? It's 1 over r e to the minus i theta, right? So it, what happens when you change the angle to minus the angle? What's that do? Yeah, it reflects it across the x-axis, so I think the reciprocal mapping just takes the upper quarter plane to the lower, to the lower quarter plane, is that right? Um, so even more useless. Even more useless? Oh, yeah, you're right. Sam's example is also useless. All right, I, I will try to come up with a more useful example in the help session later, but it's going to take me some time. All right. All right, so I'm, I'm got some pieces out here. I'm now going to show you... <clears throat> oh, come on, stupid phone. So let us get back to Mobius transformations. So I claimed last time that every Mobius transformation is the composite of a what? A, a translation, a magnification, a rotation, and an inversion. And you can prove every, every separate one of those takes circles to circles or lines. So if we say a line is a circle that goes through infinity, then we just take generalized circles to generalized circles. So this little calculation right here Oops, AZ plus B over CZ plus D. If we look at this, this is equal to A over C. So assume C is non-zero, all right? So assuming C is non-zero, A over C, CZ plus D minus AD over C plus B, all divided by CZ plus D, which is equal to... A over C plus B minus AD over C, all divided by CZ plus D. Now, there's a, first of all, notice that the linear transformation, right, if we think about Z maps to AZ plus B, which is a linear transformation, <laughs> in the sense of complex geometry, not in the sense of your Math 321 course in that case. In Math 321, this is in a fine transformation, is it not? If B is non-zero. Just saying. Right? Because linear transformations map zero to zero. You guys have not talked about linear transformations yet in 321, huh? You said you're just talking about boxes as numbers. Yeah. That means no linear transformations yet, uh, right? I know that was last week. Oh, last week. Okay, well then you already know. So technically speaking, anyway, this kind of transformation is what? This is, this is a translation and also a magnification and a rotation, right? So when you look at the formula, this is a, you know, a typical Mobius transformation. Z maps to this. That's my W, so to speak. And if you look at it, well, we're, we're, we're doing a linear transformation of this, right? Then we're flipping it over. We're multiplying by that number and then we're translating by that. So this formula makes it explicit that a Mobius transformation is a composite of successive, you know, magnifications, rotations, translations, and inversions, all right? 
And you can prove every separate one of those takes a generalized circle to a generalized circle. All right? So, that's very neat. Furthermore, we can prove, here's a claim, if we have t of z equal to az plus b over cz plus d, suppose that, suppose this has what's called a fixed point. What's a fixed point of a mapping? T of z equals z, right. So can you guys tell me, what, what does that mean then? What could, look at that, what, what do we got here? This is az plus b equal to cz squared, right, plus dz. In other words, that would be cz squared um, plus d minus a times z uh, minus b equals to zero. What's that? For c not equal to zero, that is a quadratic equation, right? Um, so if, if c equals to zero, then, um, then that's kind of a, an annoying one. If c equals to zero, what is this? It's just, it's really just a linear transformation and it will in a fine transformation to be more precise. Uh, uh, but if c is not zero, then that's a quadratic equation. Well, even if, excuse me, if, if c were a linear transformation, how many fixed points, suppose c were zero, how many fixed points would this mapping have? If c is zero, this has at most one fixed point. And, th and then only then, when b is zero, in which case it fixes the origin, and that is all. But otherwise, a linear transformation moves everything, right? Only, only only a homogeneous linear transformation in the usual sense of the terminology fixes the origin. Like if b is non-zero, it moves everything. There's no fixed point. What if, b is zero and a is if we have a bar, a bar z plus b bar equal to z, then that gives me that. Oh, you're saying what if So if this were zero, all oh, you're saying a bar could be equal to one. So if a is, so if, if a bar is equal to one, if b bar is equal to zero, and if c is equal to zero, then we have a d, a bar d bar minus b bar c bar equal to what? What was my d? Oh, well it does seem like it's, So in that case, what's, what's, what's the fixed point? Oh, 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 if, and, okay, so what if, what, what is that? I think it's the identity transformation. Okay, very good, very good, thank you. That is something I should have ruled out at the start of this discussion. The identity transformation fixes everything, and that's a kind of silly example of a Mobius transformation, which is allowed. I mean, technically it is a Mobius transformation, the, the mapping which just sends every z to z. I mean, z to z, just f of z equals to z is a Mobius transformation. True. True, true, true. So, let me get to it then. The point is, either the Mobius transformation is the identity transformation and therefore has infinitely many fixed points, right? Or the Mobius transformation fixes at most how many? Two points. All right? It follows then that three points uniquely define a Mobius transformation. Let me show you how. So what we can do is suppose, well, I'm not sure I have time to actually do it now. Ah, curses. Ah. All right. 
I'm sorry, I'm hopelessly behind. I'm going to spend all of Monday on Mobius transformations. That's just where we are. I mean, I have to admit defeat, right? So, you know, which means that I'll start talking about complex integration Wednesday instead of Monday, like it says on my schedule. I think so. So <laughs> let me again tell you what we're going to do. Um, Oh yes, I'm planning to, I'm, I'm going to send you, I have a, I scanned a PDF of this, so basically it's chapter 7, and yes, there's, there's an early section which is on the how to construct like the washer formulas like we just did, like I did that example of, he has a little section on that, and then he has a section on the conformal mapping, so I'll send you both, yeah. I, I don't have the whole chapter 7 scanned because the last section is on what are called Schwartz-Christoffel transformations. And that's the stuff that I think is just a little bit too fussy for us in here, um, given our current, you know, progress. So, again, just a second here. <clears throat> so if we had two, if we had two Mobius transformations, right? And if you had, um, you know, T of Z1 equal to W1, T of Z2 equal to W2, T of Z3 equals to W3, right? And you also had that, that was, there was another Mobius transformation that did the same, right? So suppose you have two Mobius transformations, both of which map to the same triple of points. Then if you look at T composed with S inverse, what does it do? Or, or uh, I guess I should calculate, yeah, of W1, rather. Then that's what, what's S inverse of W1? It's Z1, yeah? Which is Is one special? I mean, I don't have to put a one there. I could just as well put J and point out that the composite T composed with S inverse, right? What's it do? It fixes three points, right? But another part of the thing we can prove is that the composite of Mobius transformations is a Mobius transformation. So T composed with S inverse is again a Mobius transformation. So we have a Mobius transformation that fixes three points. Therefore, it's the identity transformation, right? Which means that these Mobius transformations are equal. Therefore, if you tell me three points which a Mobius transformation must map, you have uniquely fixed the Mobius transformation. This idea leads to something called the cross ratio, which gives us a simple prescription to calculate a Mobius transformation that maps a given three points to a given three points in an orderly fashion. You can just write down the formula. I'll illustrate this some in the help session today, but I'll do it again Monday since not everybody's supposed to come to the help session. Blah, blah, blah. So after abstract starts at 3, I'll be here from like 3 till 5.15 to help you guys. You do not have to come the whole time. You don't have to come any of the time but I will take your homework until like 5.15. I've written the next homework. I will post it today. Just, yeah. You. you look, hey, that is not the appropriate reaction. <laughs> What's that? When is it due? When is it due? Next